Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and we're going to get off on a new footing this morning. Having finished the book, uh, The Ark and the Dove, by J. Moss Ives, I've chosen a book that I have anticipated reading here on the broadcast for a long time. And I'm very excited to uh, read this book and discuss it with you. The object of reading this book, well, let me just put it this way. I consider this book, the title of which is Code Word Barbalon. The full title is Code Word Barbalon 666, Danger in the Vatican, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart, published by Lux Verbi Books. Book one of a two-book series, the second of which has not been released yet, entitled Antichrist is a Woman, is probably one of the most comprehensive, circumspective books that I've read so far in my research on the subject of the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And I would go so far as to say that a reading and understanding of this book is equivalent to a college education on the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And I'm not going to get far into this book before you realize why I'm excited about reading this book on the program. Um, it's an epic work. And I want to begin by reading what's on the back cover a brief excerpt says, A gripping tell-all book is as unforgettable as it is daring, a controversial and hard-hitting expose of the powers that be will outlive all its critics. Lemaitre, the editor. And further on the back side of this book, it says, This groundbreaking book is an extraordinary account of international power and intrigue that drops a bombshell of some magnitude into the lap of the reader. While Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code challenged our perspectives of our perceptions of reality and history, it failed to answer this very simple question. Who controls the secret societies? Code Word Barbalon answers that question in great detail and with impeccable proof. In this impressive piece of deceptive, uh, excuse me, in this impressive piece of detective work, P.D. Stewart gives us a startling and compelling look into the machinations of an elite secret society that man manipulates and controls world events. Now we're not going to get far into this book before you realize what that secret society is. And for those who hate suspense, I'm going to I'm going to tell you it's the Jesuit order. All right. A work of great insight and moral courage, this book exposes in the unequivocal terms the secrets, connections, the oaths, the code words of the powers that be. Code word Barbalon. You, you, are, are you my, anybody in my listeners getting tired of the words, the powers that be? That's what this book is. You know, the nameless, faceless powers that be. It's like, it's like stepping into the shower with a raincoat on, isn't it? Have you, ever, have you ever asked yourself, who are these powers that be? Give me a name and a face so I can know who these quote-unquote powers that be are. That's what this book is. Puts a name and a face on that most overused, totally bereft of information phrase, powers that be. That's what this book does, and that's why I'm so excited to read it. It says, Code Word Barbalon is a tough book. It contains no compromise, no apologies, and no vagaries. It spares no characters, high or low. This book does not just name names, it connects the dots. Now, before <laughs> this man and this book, I mean, is after my own heart. 
It's a tough book. It contains no compromise, no apologies, and no vagaries. It spares no characters, high or low. This book does not just name names. It connects the dots. You know, I'm connected to the, at the hip to this book. It says, it uncovers a plot so sinister that the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, who I'll remind you, was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, well connected with this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. He knew what it was all about. It says the FBI director, J. J. Edgar Hoover, had, uh, uh, had to admit, quote, the individual coming face-to-face with a conspiracy so monstrous cannot believe it exists, unquote. See, that, that's the glory of infinite wickedness, that it is so infinitely wicked that a human heart can't even, can't even accept that it exists. J. Edgar Hoover was one of the leaders of that infinitely wicked secret society that controls the world. He was one of the powers that be. There's a name and a face to go along with that word, the, the powers that be. J. Edgar Hoover, a homosexual, pedophile, CIA director, Shriner Freemason. It continues, code word Barbalon puts the spotlight on a global organization about which President Woodrow Wilson once wrote, quote, the few who are aware of it dare not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Yes, Woodrow Wilson, who sold this country down the drain when it passed the Federal Reserve Act, he too was a victim of this powers that be, the Jesuit order, and put the Pope's bankers in charge of the economy and the printing of money in this country. It says, an instance of high scholarship and intelligence. And I'll just tell you, this book is highly referenced. Everything is documented with citations that can be researched and looked up, looked up for yourself. And... Uh, it, it continues, an instance of high scholarship and intelligence. This book is not only timely and compelling, it is a must-read for everyone who cares about our world. A riveting view of world power that deserves to be on the bookshelf of every intelligent, independent-thinking person, journalist, and politician, and I'll just add regular listeners of Inquisition Update. It needs to be on the bookshelf, the coffee table, of every listener to this program. Here's a quote from an ex-Jesuit priest, M. Leon. He says, There are, in the central house at Rome, huge registers with alphabetized edges, wherein are inscribed the names of all the important persons, friends, or enemies. In those registers are recorded facts related to the lives of each individual. It is the most gigantic biographical collection that has ever been formed. The conduct of a light woman, the hidden failings of a statesman, are recounted in these books with cold impartiality. When it is required to act in any way upon an individual, they open the book and become immediately acquainted with his life, his character, his qualities, his defects, his projects, his family, his friends, and his most secret acquaintances, unquote. That again by Abbott Leon. It's total information awareness, and Rome's got all the information. What do they plan to do with it? That's what this book is about, that and many, many other subjects. Again, the full title, Code Word Barbalon 666, Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. Book one of a two-book series. The second one is not out yet. This is current information. The author is P.D. Stewart, 
And you can get this book at Lux Verbi Books. That's L-U-X hyphen V-E-R-B-I Books. They also have a website, www.luxverbi.org. That's L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I dot O-R-G. It's, it's, it's really a fascinating book. And it's a one-stop shop. If you want to buy just one book and have all the information you need at your fingertips, it's this book by P.D. Stewart, Code Word Barbalon. Now, the book has, what is it, 48 chapters. It's a lengthy book, and I don't apologize for that. As long as we're telling the truth and as long as we're covering the vital information that we need to know about the New World Order, then length and time spent is not a consideration. And uh, this book is going to be riveting. It's going to keep my listeners interested, and it's going to keep you your mind's active. And I ask my listeners every morning when you come to the computer to listen to this program that you send the kids out to play, that you put the dog out on the leash, make sure you give him plenty of food and water and put him in the shade, and go into your computer room and shut the door. Dedicate an hour every morning to listen to this program and listen to what this book has to say. Turn off all the internal noise. Clear your mind and close your eyes and listen to this book. Glean as much information as you can. Better yet, buy a copy of this book and read it for yourself. Read it more than once. Now, people immediately are going to be struck by the na- by the title, Code Word Barbalon. It was a, uh, a, mecha- a mechanism to draw suspense, obviously, by the author. And uh, I want to explain to my listeners right now where he got that word. And in the back of the book, he explains... He waits till the back of the book to explain this, and I want to get it out front. By way of footnote, the author writes, If my reader is curious to know how the name of the title of this book was chosen, the story goes something like this. The name Barbalon, usually translated into English as Babylon, comes from Barbalo, the Greek, meaning forethought or first emanation of the Supreme Being, the mother of the Aeons. She was referred to by the pagans as Isis, Queen of Heaven, Enoya, the womb of the world and the mother of God, all of which are pedigrees of the same deity, whom in Roman Catholicism is called Mary. The Gnostics and pagans regarded this entity as an emanation of the first cause, the captive principle, or excuse me, the creative principle, who in turn created the entire manifest world, the ineffable parent, and the sorcerer Simon Magus. Now remember our study of Simon Magus? Simon Peter meets Simon the sorcerer? Listen to what this author says. And the sorcerer Simon Magus, of whom it has been said with some justification, was the first Catholic pope or quote unquote father, equated the Anoia with Sophia, the co creatrix. Today the Catholic Church calls Mary co redemptrix and co creatrix of the universe. Simon Magus also taught that in Enoya, Sophia, Isis, Mary, call her what you will, was the action of the Father Creator manifesting through the Son. Hence her title, Barbalo, in the Greek, the mother of all occult systems of religion. Thus, Barbalon becomes a code word, not just for Rome, but for all pagan systems from which Rome has borrowed and of those that have been borrowed from Rome. Let me read that again. This is, this is the you know, this is the the full explanation of the word Barbalon. 
Barbalon becomes a code word not just for Rome, but for all pagan systems from which Rome has borrowed and of those that have borrowed from Rome. That would include any apostate Protestant religion which has followed the pagan practices, liturgy, and teachings of Rome. For Revelation says Rome is the mother of harlots. In other words, Rome has daughters. And you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out who Rome's daughters are. They're in apostasy. They're in the same apostasy as Rome. And they have to repent. And we have to make a decision. And the, the, the choice, the godly choice for us is given in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5. And I've quoted it till it's become cliche on the program. But it's the now word from God to his people. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. We're to get out of these ecumenical Romanized churches. Get out of the Catholic Church and get out of all her daughter, her daughter's churches. They've become ecumenical. They become controlled by that diabola in Rome, and it's time to beat feet and get on our knees before Christ and confess our sins, give up our pagan practices, and worship Him in spirit and in truth. And if it's not in the Bible, it's not worship. God defines what worship is. It's obedience. And to deviate either to the left or to the right of that specific instruction of God is self-defeating. And the churches are apostate. Now, let me continue. He says, as for the subtitle of the book, The Sons of Loyola, etc., I should hope that the reason for having chosen it is now plainly obvious. What should you do now? How is this battle to be fought? Quote, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. The word Zerubbabel means a seed from Babylon, or to have come out of Babylon. Consider also the Latin verb, quitacit consented. Who is, uh, he who is silent consents. That's what the Latin proverb means. He who is silent consents. Gives permission. Will you, by your silence, consent to the deceptions, falsehoods, and secret designs of the sons of Loyola, the Freemasons, the papacy, and her minions? Sound the alarm. Not a moment is to be lost. We must make haste. The moments are precious. And that's what this book is. A sound of the alarm. And that's what my job is, too, to sound the alarm. And to make no uncertain sounds. To be unequivocating in my speech. To be direct in my thoughts. And to leave no room for doubt. To be certain of what I'm saying is the truth. To blast the sound of warning loud and long. To elicit action. Now I want to read the foreword of the book. Some of you are probably anxious. Get on with it, Tom. Get on to chapter 1. Patience. Let's read it. 
The foreword of the book is preceded by a couple quotes. The first is from Sir Winston Churchill. Listen to what he said. Quote, Men often stumble over the truth, but some pick themselves up and hurry on as if nothing had happened. Are we those men who stumble over the truth and just pick ourselves up and carry on? That may have been, that may have described me at one time, but not anymore. Here's another one from Plato. Those who do not take an interest in public affairs are doomed to be ruled by evil men. Now, to get on with the forward, it says, We know of no other volume of its kind to compare with the one before us, speaking of this book. Some startling suggestions have been made in this new book, and we guarantee that the reader will be compelled and charmed, and must be by the wit and elegance and force and fire of every page of this groundbreaking book. Code Word Barbalon is a work of stunning geopolitical revelations. It presents an array of facts that reveal a daring but subtle plan of seizing a global power, a compelling portrait of the future, and a most extraordinary account of international power and intrigue. Good historians, wrote Horace Walpole, are the most scarce of all writers, and no wonder. A good style is not very common. Thorough information is still rare, and if these meet... What a chance that impartiality should be added to them. P.D. Stewart's work possesses all these qualities. Consisting of 48 page-turning chapters with hundreds of footnotes and references, Code Word Barbalon covers a vast period of history from the 2nd and 3rd centuries to the present day. Spatially, the book spans three continents and focuses on Europe and North America and the hidden influence of secret societies on that continent. It encompasses within its asides many other countries, too. Indeed, reading Code Word Barbalon, one cannot help but feel as if he were traveling in H.G. Wells' time machine, finding himself sometimes in the city of Rome in the 16th century, at other times in Bavarian Germany in the 18th century, yet at other times in the political intrigues of North America in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Using his favorite technique, P.D. Stewart holds his judgments and his, and, and his readers in, in suspense by off, uh, excuse me. Using his favorite technique, P.D. Stewart holds his judgments and his, and his readers in suspense by offering the reader a range of options in the interpretation of an event. Through fixing multiple layers of insinuation, innuendo, and hidden meaning, and by his coupling of contrasting facts, then explaining such antitheses. P.D. Stewart identifies the role played by some of the major personalities in the history of the secret societies, from Jacques de Molay to Ignatius Loyola, from Adam Weishaupt to Adolf Hitler, from Albert Pike to Cecil Rhodes, and from Abraham Lincoln to the recent presidents of the United States of America. In doing so, he uncovers a plot so sinister that in the words of ex-FBI director and founder J. Edgar Hoover, the individual coming face-to-face -face with a conspiracy so monstrous cannot believe it exists. P.D. Stewart reveals the connection between the Illuminati, Skull and Bones, Phi Beta Kappa, the Council on Foreign Relations, and other secret fraternities. So we'll finish the forward when we get back to the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Now we're going to continue with the, the forward to the book, The Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. It says, P.D. Stewart reveals the connection between the Illuminati, Skull and Bones, Phi Beta Kappa, the Council on Foreign Relations, and other secretive fraternities, like the American college sororities. The array of secret societies he covers is quite staggering. Code Word Barbalon is undoubtedly a tough book. It is direct, honest, and thought-provoking. It contains no compromise, no apologies, and no vagaries. It spares no characters. All are lashed without ceremony. The result is a book that is extremely credible, erudite, and completely and compellingly readable. It represents the latest and most thorough use of the available material on the subject, bringing order and much-needed clarity to the confusing mass of secret society books currently on the market. It connects the dots completely, thoroughly, and intelligently. And I will just add, this is a book that Alex Jones wouldn't even offer for sale on his book, on his uh, website. This is the information. The, the, the information contained in this book is the information that Alex Jones dances around by the most gymnastic moves. 
you're going to be stunned by this book. Code Word Barbalon is undoubtedly a tough book. It's direct, honest, and thought-provoking, contains no compromise, no apologies, no vagaries. It spares no characters. All are lashed without ceremony. The book is a book that is extremely erudite, credible, and compellingly readable. It represents the latest, most thorough use of available information on the subject, bringing order to a much-needed and much-needed clarity to the confused mass of secret society books currently on the market. It connects the dots completely, thoroughly, and intelligently. An instance of high scholarship, supported by much careful research, P.D. Stewart has written what must be considered one of the most authoritative accounts of the great secret society. That's the Jesuit order. And he does so with exceptional finesse, utilizing records inaccessible to or overlooked by other writers. Stewart reveals the identity of the power about which Woodrow Wilson once said, quote, The few who are aware of it dare not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Unquote. Once you have read this book, you will no longer look askance at such statements. Code Word Barbalon is essential reading for anyone interested in the present-day operations of the powerful secret societies at the heart of American and European politics, and of which Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code barely alluded to. But until you read this book, you'll probably have no idea of who controls all these powerful secret societies. Rest assured, however, that Stewart's book is everything that Dan Brown's book is not. The author reveals the power about which Benjamin Disraeli, Lord Beaconsfield, who became Prime Minister in 1868, spoke when in the House of Commons, July 14, 1856, he hinted, quote, There is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house. I mean the secret societies. <clears throat> It is useless to the whole of France and to say nothing of other countries is covered with a network of those secret societies. That I apprehend as a fact. Unquote. Stewart reveals something even more intriguing: the connection between the mark of the beast, the number six 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 and a statement by former President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Charles Malik. Quote, listen to this quote, The only hope for the Western world lies then in a united Europe under the control of the Pope. Unquote. Put simply, this book reveals facts that are so serious, so startling, so compelling, that all should be made aware. To borrow the words of Henry Lincoln, quote, something extraordinary is waiting, unquote. Why should you care about what's written in this book? You shouldn't. Go back to sleep. Well, a little sarcasm there to cap things off. What do you talk? If you're bothering yourself to even ask what is written in this book, why should you care about what's written in this book? You don't care. My listeners care, and like me, I'm sure they're anxious to get into this book. So with no further ado, we're going to begin with the secret instructions of the Jesuits. This is talking about the modus operandi of the Jesuit order, the most powerful, the most influential, the most diabolical secret society on the planet. They control the presidents, the kings, the queens, the potentates of the world, and they control the white pope. The Jesuit general is known as the black pope, the most sinister, the most powerful, the most roughly alive. And I've characterized him this way. Right along, this is my perception of the black pope after all the research that I've done. He is the human interface between Satan and humanity. Now, many are going to roll their eyes, Tom, you're being a little bit melodramatic, but listen, by the time we get done with this book, I'm sure you'll have a similar assessment. 
of what the Jesuit order is and what the black pope is. All right. Most wise, what is the secret? Another quote from the Psalms, 94. Quote, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unquote. My answer to that is, pick me, Lord. Beginning now with the text. In the year 1870, excuse me, 1780, a young and obscure French archaeologist who will remain anonymous. Now, the, the author is very careful. I'm sure he knows the name of this archaeologist. But when we further discuss what this archaeologist found and what became of his discovery, we'll understand that the author has chosen wisely to keep his name name anonymous. Because when we discover who he's dealing with, the Jesuit order, we realize that having committed a sin such as this archaeologist has committed, his posterity, his family, his sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons in perpetuity would suffer for his crime in revealing the secret instructions of the Jesuits. And if I knew his name, I don't think I would reveal it either. In the year 1780, a young and obscure French archaeologist who will remain anonymous made a most unlikely and surprising find, a discovery that was afterwards destined to cause renewed and wide and worldwide interest in a notorious secret society. So the record states. Although he did not realize it at the time, the young archaeologist's discovery would shed light on the most intriguing statement by the abbot M. Leon, who said, quote, there, are in, there are in the central house at Rome huge registers wherein are inscribed the names of all the important persons, friends, and enemies. It is the most gigantic biographical collection that has ever been formed. When it is required to act in any way upon an individual, they open the book and become immediately acquainted with his life, his character, his qualities and defects, his projects, his family, his friends, his most secret acquaintances, unquote. The circumstances which led to the young Frenchman's discovery began innocently enough. His archaeological dig involved working on a project high up in the remotest recesses of the Andes, where the condors soar and the llamas feed, a strange place where glaciers and hummingbirds live almost side by side. This was a land that the Incas once ruled more than three centuries before. Not long after his arrival in Peru, the young archaeologist rented a small room from a family in a tiny village in the backwater of the South, country, uh, South American country. This room he used as his base, to which he would return periodically to recover from his work at the dangerously high altitudes of the Andes and to write his reports for shipment to France. It often happened that while he was away, the Peruvian family would rent the room to overnight guests. On one such occasion, the guest happened to be a Jesuit priest. On his departure, the priest forgot to take his little book that he had hidden under the mattress in his room. On returning to his room, the French archaeologist made the discovery, a discovery that would change his life. He found the little book. As he browsed quickly through its pages, he realized its importance. It was a highly classified manual of procedure for the top leadership of the Jesuit Je uh, of the Society of Jesus. It was called the Secreta Monita Societas Jesu, or the Secret Instructions of the Society of Jesus, also known as the Secreta Monita, or the Monita Secreta. The inside of the book bore the seal, signature, and attestation of the Jesuit general, the secretary of the order in Rome, that is, the black pope. Now, on its face, it purported to contain instructions from Father Claudio Acquaviva, the fifth Jesuit general of the Society of Jesus, addressed to the various superiors of the, of, of the Jesuits around the world, 
and laying down the methods to be adopted for the extension of their power and influence of the order and for the increasing of its wealth. Written in Latin, the preface specifically warns superiors, quote, not to allow it to fall into the hands of strangers, lest they form a bad opinion of the order, unquote. Of great interest to the Frenchman was the second chapter of this secret instructions entitled, what must be done to get the ear and intimacy of great friend, of, of great men, unquote. Said the instructions, quote, We must endeavor to breed dissension among great men and raise seditions and anything a prince would have us do to please him. If one who is chief minister of a state to a monarch oppose us and that prince, and that prince cast his whole favors upon him, so as to add titles to his honor, we must present ourselves before him and court him in the highest degree, as well as visits, uh, as well by visits as all humble respect. Unquote. So they ingratiate themselves with the most powerful people in the world. And it says the most alarming part of the secret instructions, the Monita was the final chapter, which read, quote, We must be careful to change our politics, conforming to the times, and excite the princes, friends of ours, to mutually make terrible wars, that everywhere the mediation of our society will be implored. Those who do not love us shall fear us, unquote. That's what they do. They're a political animal. They are a militia. And their purpose is to be all things to all men and to ingratiate themselves to the most powerful people in the world to manipulate uh, and create terrible wars to make the parties in those conflicts seek advice from the Jesuit order. And that's exactly what's taking place in this country. That's what has taken place everywhere the Jesuits have set foot since their creation in 1540. They are the ones who incite the wars. They are the ones that manipulate both sides in the conflict. And they are the ones who are consulted by both sides for the solutions. It's the Hegelian dialectic they work to perfection the most sinister organization on the planet. And they are the advisors of the kings of this world. That includes the President of the United States. Now, continuing the book, it says, Realizing the significance of his discovery, for the next few days, the French archaeologist labored furiously, translating the work into his own language. Once done, he replaced the book and left the village. The Jesuit returned a few days later, anxiously inquiring after his little black book. We can imagine the look that must have been shown on his face as though he could drive his head through a brick wall, as if he was prepared to do it. He demanded to know whether anyone else had occupied the room since his departure. On being told that the young archaeologist had rented the room, he began such a relentless search that the Frenchman was compelled to leave Peru in haste. The young man eventually arrived in San Francisco, California, where the Monita was published in English in 1882 in a work entitled The Engineer Corps of Hell. Now, you can get that book in disc form. I believe Eric John Phelps is selling it. You can buy it on his website, www.vaticanassassins.org, for a nominal price. I think it's $10 or something. And you can read that book yourself. That's where the secret, the Secreta Monita, or the instructions of the Jesuits, was included in this book entitled The Engineer Corps of Hell. Get it from Eric John Phelps on his website, www.vaticanassassins.org. Now, continuing with the book, it says, Consisting of 17 chapters, the Secreta Monita was considered to be the definitive statement of Jesuit strategy a document of monumental importance from which the principles of their government would be delineated. 
the response of the Jesuits to this extraordinary revelation was to flatly deny it, saying that the Secreta Moneta was a malicious forgery of one Hieronymus Zorowski. Uh, and he was a Pole and an ex-Jesuit, they claimed. According to them, it first appeared in print in Krakow in 1612 under the title Monita Privata Societas Jesu. And Zorowski, they declared, had, quote, served his connection with the society in 1611, excuse me, had severed his connection with the society, that is, the Jesuit order, in 1611, and he spitefully published the Monita with the cooperation of Count George Zabraski and other Polish enemies of the order, the Jesuit order, unquote. However, on the other hand, the British historian and former Jesuit novice Andrew Steinmetz, with his precisely documented history of the Jesuits, has devoted several pages to an analysis of the genuineness and history of the Monita. He concluded that the document was in accordance with Jesuit principles. Steinmetz also cites numerous documented instances, instances of Jesuit conduct and terrorist-like atrocities in his three volumes, all of which tend to cast doubt on the assertion that the Monita is a forgery. What is the truth in this matter? Was the secret Monita a malicious hoax, a clever forgery, or was it a true statement of Jesuit global strategy and ambition? He's going to discuss now the, um, the authenticity of the Monita. According to Gratzer, a well-known member of the Society of Jesus, the, secret, the Secreta Monita, the secret instructions of the Jesuits, was a malicious creation by the former Jesuit Zoroaski who had been dismissed with ignominy from the society in Poland. Quote, and so as to cover his own disgrace or to gratify his revenge, he published the Monita in Poland in 1612. However, the reader should not attach a high degree of accuracy to the Jesuits' denial of the authentic authenticity of the Monita, says Gretzka, for all the other Jesuits forgot to mention one very important fact that the Monita had been publication long before 1612. So try again, gentlemen. That answer will hardly pass. That the Jesuits' labeling of the Monita as a forgery is Machiavellian seems to be proved by the discovery in the British Museum of a work entitled, and it's Latin and I'll probably butcher it, but please suffer me, uh, HCE, whatever that is, Formula Provisionum Diversorum, a Gasper Casarello Sumo Studio and Unum, printed in Venice, not Poland, and it was printed in 1596, and which had and which had appended to it a copy of the Secreto Monita. So the Jesuits <laughs> called this thing a forgery by a Je uh, by an ex Jesuit who left the order in disgrace and wanted to humiliate and to damage the order in revenge, in spite, but, but they suggested that it was written in 1612 when, in fact, it first appeared in public print in 1596. So are the Jesuits telling the truth? The, the secret instructions of the Jesuits is an authentic document. It got leaked, and um, it's in the world, and we're going to find out more about it. It says that is 16 years before the alleged forgery in a different country, and significantly, the copy of the Monita in the British, Mu in the British Museum is in manuscript form. This internal evidence, dated earlier than 1596, would appear to confound all arguments to the contrary. Thus, the most con conclusive statement on the authenticity of the Monita comes from the age of the document itself. Therefore, the original Monita could not have been first published in Poland in 1612, as alleged by the Jesuits. 
It is most revealing, too, that the manuscript version of the Secreta Monita in the British Museum also ends with a mandate similar to that written in the book found by the young archae French archaeologist in 1780. Quote, Let them be denied to be the rules of the Society of Jesus, if ever they shall be impugned to us. Unquote. Thus, the Jesuits' denial amounts to little. Indeed, the German ex-Jesuit Count von Hosenbreck, who left the Jesuit priesthood in 1900, published a rendition of the Secreta Monita, which he translated from German. He wrote in his book, 14 Years of Jesuit, quote, It is natural that the Jesuits themselves should deny the genuineness in a flood of refutations, unquote, for they are told to do so. Count von Hosenbrecht then adds, quote, Only sound proof can turn the scale against the genuineness of the Monita, and such proofs have not been produced up to now by the Jesuits, nor has any convincing invalidation of the facts advanced on behalf of its genuineness been produced. Their genuineness rely essentially on the fact that the manuscript copies of the Monita, upon which the printed edition is based, were to be found in Jesuit colleges. The discovery of such copies in the Jesuit colleges of Prague, Paris, uh, uh, Roermond in Holland, Munich, and Paderborn in Westphalia is beyond question. The copy in the Jesuit house at Pat, uh, Paderborn was found in a cupboard in the rector's room. The manuscript copy at Munich belonged to the contents of the library of the Jesuit College of that place, which was suppressed in 1773, was only found in 1870 in a secret recess behind the altar of the old Jesuit church at St. Michael at Munich. Therefore, what the Jesuit writes to the contrary is of no value." Unquote. The story of the Monita of Westphalia had its genesis after the Duke of Brunswick took Pat, uh, Paderborn and seized the Jesuit college there and gave their library and papers to the Capuchin monks who made them public. Among the papers was a copy of the Monita. Again, at the end of, the, of that copy, the secret of Monita found in the Jesuit library at Paderborn is a similar injunction to that found in the copy translated by the French archaeologist in 1870. Quote, If these rules fall into the hands of strangers, they must be positively denied to, the, uh, to be the rules of the society. Unquote. And we're getting off to a, a, a powerful start, starting right off with the secret instructions of the Jesuits, their, uh, their modus operandi in the world, to gain control of world power, to raise the papacy to world supremacy. And it's my pleasure to read this book on Inquisition Update. We'll continue tomorrow. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. 
we're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built, that's crossthe